Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. Thanks to our audience here at the CG Auditorium, and also uh, to those who are watching online through our global webcast. Uh, following this evening's presentation, we welcome questions from the audience, either at the microphones here at CG, or if you're watching online through the live chat function on your screen. Uh, please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. Tonight, CG is proud to partner with the Canadian International Council, Waterloo Branch, to present our annual media panel. The CIC, Waterloo Branch, has been a faithful sponsor of this event for seven years, and we're thankful for this continued partnership. At the forefront of this partnership was former CIC Waterloo Branch President Joan Eiler. Joan recently lost her battle with cancer at the age of 74. Not only was Joan heavily involved in the CIC, but she was a pillar in the Kitchener-Waterloo community, giving her time to a number of charities, including the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the Canadian Cancer Society, and the museum. Many people could claim her as a friend. She was certainly a friend to CG and a friend to me personally, and she'll be fondly remembered for her tireless contributions to her community. I'd also like to recognize the Vice President of the local CIC chapter, Paul Doherty, who also gave a fitting tribute to Joan at the CIC dinner a few moments ago. Also tonight, I'd like to uh, recognize the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression for their part in coordinating tonight's panel. CGFE is a non-governmental organization dedicated to the defense and protection of free expression around the world. All of tonight's panelists come at their thoughtful recommendation, and we're very thankful for their participation in this event. You can meet CGFE President Tom Henheffer at the uh, CGFE information table outside, and for a small annual amount, you can actually join the organization and help to support free expression around the world. Tonight's moderator, Michelle Shepard, is also a familiar ally of the CGFE. A member of the CGFE Board of Directors, Michelle became involved with the organization after a friend of hers was targeted and killed for his journalistic efforts in Somalia. As a Toronto Star's national security reporter, Michelle is familiar with the international fight for free expression. She's written two books, Decade of Fear, Reporting from Terrorism's Grey Zone in 2011, and Guantanamo's Child, The Unstory of um, an untold story of Omar Qadar in 2008. And uh, she was an associate producer for the documentary Under Fire, Journalists in Combat. Michelle has been awarded s several top honors for her news reporting, as well as her promotion of civil rights, including the Governor General's Missioner for Public Service Journalism in 2002. She's also a member of the Canadian Journalism Foundation Forum for Violence and Trauma. So tonight we're very privileged to have Michelle here to facilitate our panel on f the fight for free expression. Please join me in welcoming Michelle now. Thank you very much and thanks Fred for the kind introduction. What he didn't say was he used to actually be my boss at the Toronto Star and put me on my first foreign posting which was to the Oshawa Bureau. So that, that, <laughs> that got me going. I haven't forgiven him since for that. But I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here uh, for this very important issue. It's lovely to see so many people come out. Uh, as was mentioned already by Fred, following our remarks, uh, there will be the two microphones here and here, uh, so please feel free to come down and uh, ask your questions, and I'll make sure to leave lots of time for that. And as Fred said, please introduce yourself first before the questions. And I'm not very good at cutting people off, so if you can keep it short, that would be great too. Um, just by way of a very short introduction before we get to the panelists, uh, I wanted to uh, stress how much free expression and free press is important. And it's something that generally, I think, Canadians, we take for granted. I, I know during my travels how humbling it can be to come across foreign journalists in the field. And we, we share the same profession and title, but it's an incredibly different experience when you're reporting somewhere where you live, and it's a repressive country. And you're going to hear some of these stories tonight from these very brave panelists, and I'm honoured to be moderating this. Just to give you some brief statistics, uh, a re recording to Reporters Without Borders, last year in 2013, 71 journalists were killed and 826 were arrested. Another 2,160 journalists were threatened or physically attacked, 87 were kidnapped and 77 fled their country. The most recent and probably most high profile cases have been of those Al Jazeera journalists being detained in Egypt and labeled terrorists. 
On a personal note, I've worked with one of them while reporting from Mogadishu, and he's just a consummate professional. And it's really shocking to know what they've gone through. And these are journalists who work for Al Jazeera, which is a powerful international organization. So think of all those others languishing in jail who we don't hear about and who don't have a voice. In, in my own reporting over the years, uh, I've been honored, as I said, to work with so many, work with and work alongside so many local journalists. Uh, as foreign reporters, we, we rely on their expertise. And I think probably the time when it really came home to me how difficult that job is, is for them was uh, a month that I spent uh, covering the, the start of the Arab Spring in Yemen. And it was a bit lonely being there on my own for a month, and Sana is not one of the easiest countries or cities to report from. And I befriended a very wonderful, uh, talented photographer named Khaled Abdullah. And he worked for Reuters, and I tagged along with him, and I was always really apologetic that I was, I was by his side all the time. But he was very good to show you the ropes, and he knew when the shooting started, you know, where to, to run and to hide. So he was a good ally. Uh, and I remember one day we were taking pictures and, and showing some pr police brutality, the start of it anyway, and the police then came up to us and they, started, they demanded our cards and they started harassing us. And, and we stood our ground and luckily we had the crowd on our side that came to our aid and they let us go. It, it wasn't a big deal. But I remember Khaled later said to me, that's why I don't mind you being with me. And he said, if, if I hadn't been there, be, there'd be no question that his cards would be taken, and he'd probably be detained for having shown any resistance. Uh, but at that time, anyway, the authorities didn't want the hassle of hassling uh, a foreign reporter. I mean, they have many other times, but at that time they didn't. And, and my point only being that so often we don't hear these stories. And really, for foreign journalists and, and the journalists up here, that was just part of daily life. That's part of doing your job. But aside from being a dangerous profession, it's, it's important also to stress just how critical journalism is for a functioning democracy. As the United Nations Ban Ki-moon has said, journalism provides a platform for informed discussion across a wide range of developmental issues. Only when journalists are at liberty to monitor, investigate, and criticize policies and action can good governance exist. Or as we like to say at our paper, The Toronto Star, Without journalism, you wouldn't know that your mayor smoked crack. So. <laughs> there is going to come a day when a Ford joke doesn't come up at a panel, but I don't, I don't think we're there yet. So, Tonight I'm honored to introduce these four exceptional journalists who share at least two things in common. First, their experiences in risking their lives in pursuit of truth, and second, having been forced to flee harm's way and find security in Canada. So tonight's panelists are Luis Najera, a visiting fellow at the Citizen Lab and the Canadian Centre for Global Security Studies at the University of Toronto. During his career as a journalist, Luis bravely covered the cartels in Mexico. Following an assassination attempt, he obtained refugee status in Canada. It was a rocky start and he has done exceptionally well. Luis sits on the board of trustees of the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, and he was one of our honorees one year for our International Journalist Freedom Award. Moving across, Aaron Berghani, the publisher and editor-in-chief of... Ma you should have Anna Maria Tremonti here. This is why I went into print, because I stumble over my words publicly. Excuse me, Aaron. Aaron is the editor-in-chief of the Mefti Enterprise, after fleeing arrest in Eritrea for publishing a letter critiquing the Eritrean government, Aaron sought refugee, refuge in Regina, Saskatchewan. He later moved to Toronto where he founded the, the paper, an Eritrean Canadian publication for the diaspora in Toronto. Mortez, Mort, who I know is more Abdullet, oh my goodness, sorry Maury, you can, you, you're going to correct me anyway. Can you turn on his microphone for one moment? Maury? It's uh, Abdul Alien. <laughs> we had a, no, discu no, we no. Had a discussion it's before It's actually Abdul Alien, Abdul Alien. We had a discussion that his, was it your son, always uh, had yes, his, his yeah. name mispronounced, so as soon as he said Abdul Alien, I then had that in my head, and so, <laughs> sorry Maury. He's an interpreter and translator with the Ontario's Ministry of Attorney General. During his journalistic career in the 1980s, Maury was persecuted in both the Philippines and Iran for his reporting. 
Over the last several decades, he has been a strong advocate for human rights and free expression. He currently sits on the board of Canadian Journalists for Free Expression and manages the blog Iran Watch Canada. And lastly, but not least, we have Maryam Agbami, who is a researcher, writer, and translator with ASL 19, an interdisciplinary research and technology lab that connects Iranians to tools that help them bypass internet censorship and access information. Previously the president of Journalists in Exile and a reporter with Voice of America, Maryam works as a translator, worked as a translator in Iran and in the Reuters Bureau in Tehran. Because of her work, Maryam's not able to go back to Iran. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming our panelists. So most of these questions, I think I'm just going to start by a few questions and we'll have a, a, a discussion. Feel free to, to jump in when you'd like and feel free to answer any of the questions or if you don't have anything to add to that, we'll move on. But I'd like to start um, by having each of you explain what, how working as a journalist in your country threatened your life and how did you decide to come back to Canada? And as we mentioned earlier, we've, Fred has told me I have to do this in five minutes each. So obviously that's a very easy task. But just give us an introduction and then hopefully through questions we'll get more stories about your life. Maybe I'll start with Miriam. Where do I start? Um, I think the easiest answer is being a woman and being a journalist are two main reasons that it wasn't easy. I'm not saying impossible, but it wasn't easy to work and be effective. Um, the system was putting invisible pressures on us uh, as I was working with Reuters. Uh, there were so many um, occasions that we were summoned, interrogated, not in a harsh way, but they were scary enough. So I decided that it's not a safe place for me to stay and I decided to move to Canada. But uh, for me, in my specific case, among others, um, I chose to live in Canada. But because of the activities that I had after moving to Canada, working with the Fifth Estate CBC's investigative unit, and also Radio Free Europe, and also other American and Canadian international and international media organizations, the, the, the fact that I was focusing on Iran and Iranian government put me on a sort of self-imposed exile. And since 2002, I have not been able to go back and visit Iran. So when you left Iran then, you didn't, you didn't presume that that would be the last time? It was when you caught, came here that you realized the work? That is true. Um, I left Iran on July 2001. Um, I got a job offer with the CBC on July 2002. I visited Iran for two weeks and I came back and after that I haven't been able to go back. It's too risky. Yeah. Well, thank you. And sorry. Uh, well, uh, let me uh, thank you, um, uh, Michelle, for um, coordinating this and also to thank uh, uh, CIGI for uh, inviting me and uh, it's an honor and uh, I hope uh, this is a good evening. And I, I just want to, uh, to read one poem, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, and this poem uh, is from uh, Hafez, uh, the Iranian lyric poet. And uh, uh, he, the, the, the uh, poem starts, I want to read it in Persian and then in English. Uh, it starts this way. Ma bedin dar napeye heshmat ja ahmadim. Az bade hadese in ja be panah ahmadim. Bande ye manzil eshqi muz sarhad adam ta be aqlim wujud in hame rah ahmadim. The burden of the long journey, the harshness of life in the new land, we are not for luxury and gold, but for truth it must be told. So this is a, a lyric uh, from uh, uh, half as. Uh, my uh, situation was different from Mariam and I just uh, uh, during the 1978-79 revolution I was in I was a student in uh, Philippines 
at that time it was uh, Marcos regime. Um, and uh, to tell the truth, uh, I saw in the, uh, uh, in the campus the security guards were beating uh, the students because of the tuition fee uh, increases and uh, their protest. And then I wrote an article, uh, a small article in the uh, student uh, campus uh, newspaper. At that time, uh, during the Marcus regime, when you write uh, an article, you have to have your student number right beside the uh, article. And uh, so I was picked by road and I, I was picked by the, uh, called by the security office. I went to the security office and uh, the chief of uh, the security told me, you cannot do this kind of things, you are a student here. Mm. Uh, we had a student advisor, foreign student ad advisor. And uh, if you continue doing this, they are going to not only expel you from university, but also from Philippines. And uh, they, uh, uh, they also put a young boy watching me all the time, wherever I go. And, uh, and the other thing was, uh, 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 was that uh, I was uh, uh, blacklisted for enrollment. And being active as a student in, uh, in the Philippines, I, uh, together with uh, a group of Iranian, uh, we published one little uh, uh, student paper. And uh, this was uh, written in, uh, we write in a stencil, and we also uh, publish by handmade, uh, handmade uh, um, uh, um, printer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, we, 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 we were writing uh, facts about the Iran-Iraq war and also the uh, regime's uh, policy. When I went back in uh, 1982 uh, in Iran, I, was, uh, I knew that in the airplane while I was going, I knew that I'm going to be arrested. And uh, uh, the, as soon as I gave my passport, they uh, uh, told me, to go to another uh, place, a location. Two uh, Revolutionary Guard took me to prosecutors, public prosecutor's uh, office in, in the airport, interrogated, wrote my uh, story, and uh, taken to the uh, Evin prison. In Evin prison, um, I just, I was blindfolded. I, all I uh, hear at that time, was machine gun shooting and also um, torture. I was right beside the torture chamber, actually. Um, the, um, you know, I had a mustache and at the time. Uh, when I came out from the uh, Evin prison, the people were laughing at me because I have eaten half of my mustache <laughs> and uh, by pushing and, uh, you know. And uh, so uh, it was a very, bad experience that I had. I arrested a few times, kidnapped, and I uh, uh, doctored my own passport. Um, and uh, I escaped uh, Iran, went to Philippines, and then from Philippines, uh, I was also again uh, by the embassy uh, threatened, and I left to Japan. And in Japan, uh, I didn't have status, so I have my always have my, uh, my United Nations passport, uh, <laughs> Red, Cross, <laughs> Red Cross passport. So, uh, and uh, what year was from, that that from there I came uh, as a stateless to Canada. I love my country dearly. That's and what year was that that you came? What, what, what year was that? It that was uh, 1989, uh, at the end of uh, 1989. And you still yes. carry that today? I'm sorry? You still used to carry your... your yes, I carry everything, papers. yeah. Yes. I did forget to mention at the beginning that uh, normally we say to turn your phones off and, and put them away, but in today's interactive world, if anybody out there happens to be on Twitter and would like to carry this event, we do have a hashtag, it's CG Live, so C-I-G-I Live, and please feel free to be sending 
uh, as we go. Aaron, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. This is a very good opportunity to speak about my country. Uh, probably, you are well informed, you know where I am. Uh, I'm from Eritrea. Uh, which is located in Northeast Africa. It is a small country. <laughs> uh, we got our independence in 1991. So if you don't know it, so that's okay because it's a new country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eritrea, when we, got its, uh, when we got our independence in 1991, uh, I was young and very ambitious because I used to see so many corruptions. Because to get our independence, more than 65,000 Eritreans died to expel the Ethiopian uh, uh, colonizers. So as a result, my three older brothers died during the war. Uh, it is a common story of every Eritrean. So for me, it was personal. I felt like, uh, okay, I have to do something because my brother died for this and it is my duty to secure it. So at the beginning, the government didn't allow any free press to function. So finally, with the pressure of international community, IMF, uh, because the government was looking for a uh, loan, so in order to be eligible for IMF and World Bank loan, so you have to have free market, you have to have free press, you have to have multi-party system. The government didn't have a single one of those. So in order to be eligible for IMF and World Bank, they were forced to issue a press law that could allow free press to function. So that was in 1996. So I was one of the luckiest Eritrean who got education, graduated in journalism and mass communication. So I said, okay, this is a good opportunity for me. Uh, because the only way that you can persuade the government and educate the people is by you know, owning the media. Because before that, I used to write critical things to the government-owned media but they never published my article. So I used it to be frustrated by that. So finally, when that press law was issued, so I co-founded with my two friends the first independent newspaper in Eritrea. And it became the largest one. So I ran that paper for four years as editor-in-chief. It was not a smooth road, because in Eritrea, there is no constitution. Our constitution was ratified in 1997, but the president refused to implement it. So the country is run without constitution until this day. And we haven't seen any election since 1993, uh, because at that time we became uh, recognized by the international community. So. We used to push the government to implement the constitution, to discipline the corrupt generals, uh, at least to invest on education, health. Mm -hmm. So we were very aggressive in the way we were covering. So I started my paper as bi-weekly, but it became twice a week. We started with 5,000 copies. Now, uh, uh, by the time we were forced to close, we used to print 40,000. Oh. So it became the largest newspaper and very well read. We had very good sources from the government officials, of course. They were really looking to see some changes. But every time we write some critical things to the, the, in our paper, as editor-in-chief, I used to be summoned to the police station. So it was routine for me to be summoned to the police station once or twice a week. So they interrogate you, where did you get this information? Uh, what do you mean by this when you say that? So they ask you very trivial, very small questions. 
And in order to ask you just one question, they let you sit for three hours. So you have to wait three hours to answer just one little question. So it is a kind of mental torture. And they used to summon me to the police station during my busiest day, because the paper used to come out, comes out uh, every Tuesday and uh, Fridays. So the day before, uh, I was usually busy because I have to read everything, what is going to be printed uh, the next day. So, uh, I guess the mic is gone. That wasn't on purpose. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so it was. So it was very. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. ah, okay. So it was very uh, difficult to uh, run the paper because they used it to torture us psychologically by uh, summoning to the police station. But we never stopped it, and the, gov the government didn't dare to take action against us because of the fear of the international community. So they use it simply to uh, put threat against us, intimidation, telephone threat. So that was a common phenomenon at that time. But the turning point was when the September 11 incident happened. When the World Trade Center was attacked, the president was. Okay. When the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what he had said was the turning point was 9 11. So the turning point was after the World Trade Center was attacked. At that time, everybody was looking what is going on in USA in other world. So the attention of the world was not into Eritrea. So the president was smart enough to exploit that. So he shut down. Uh, before that, you know, the reason, uh, one thing that I should mention very important is 15 senior officials, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vice President, uh, Minister of Officials, 15 senior officials, they wrote an open letter that criticized the president. Then I published that uh, paper, that letter in my newspaper. The name of those people were in that list. But I was summoned to the police station to answer who gave you that letter. Then I told them, what is the point? They have listed their name, and I don't want to give any name who gave me that letter. But uh, I said, uh, so I just got it from the internet. Uh, but they summoned me almost uh, five times simply to answer that question. So when that September 11 incident happened, you know, they arrested those 15, journal, 15 senior officials. And they shut down the seven independent newspapers, including my newspaper. Then after that, when they shut down the newspaper, so I knew what was coming. And fortunately, I had good sources. And they advised me to be careful. So I never slept at my home. So I never spent time in the place that I used to entertain myself. So I stayed away. I slept you know, in my friends or family friends or relatives' place. Then finally, after five days of the closure of our newspaper, the security agents started to pick up every journalist. Mm. So all my colleagues were arrested at that time. Luckily, I was not at home the night they came on September 20, uh, September 23rd, 2001. So all my colleagues are still in jail, but I managed to escape. Uh, five of my colleagues who have been arrested at that time have died in prison. Mm -hmm. And we don't know about the rest, whether they are alive or not. The government hasn't filed a single 
charge against them. So they simply accuse us as traitors, as collaborators with Ethiopia to overthrow the government. So they gave us different names simply to justify their action. So when that happened, so I didn't have any choice. But it was very difficult to escape at that time. So I went for a hiding. So I was in a hiding for more than three months, 103 days to be exact. Finally, I forged an ID. I changed my appearance. I was looking much older than my age because I put a lot of gray uh, on my hair. Uh, with the help of a guide, then I crossed to Sudan. Then finally, I was granted political asylum mm. by the Canadian government. But as a reprisal, my cousin and my brother were arrested. My wife and my children were not allowed to leave the country. So they were, uh, you know, became uh, the victim of my action. So, but I was lucky, I was granted political asylum by Canadians, so I came in 2002, at the end of 2002 in Canada. Mm. And so. Eritrea remains at the bottom of free press lists every, every year. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. And one of the most dangerous countries that's at the top is often Mexico. And Luis, can you tell us your story? Thank you. Uh, well, my story, uh, well, I worked uh, in, as a correspondent for uh, Grupo Reforma, which is the largest and most influential newspaper group in Mexico. It's around, they have several newspapers, but uh, it's around one million daily circulation. Uh, and I worked as a correspondent based on uh, Ciudad Juarez, uh, which on that time, well, between 2008 and 2010, it was considered the uh, deadliest city in the world. We have more than 3,000 assassinations per year. And uh, my case, well, I, I was really engaged in uh, doing a job around or exposing corruption, official corruption, uh, exposing organized crime groups, uh, both sides, US and Mexico. And uh, in... Uh, since the beginning of 2008, uh, I begin to uh, notice that uh, the environment was changing, uh, and uh, so I, I, I begin to expose uh, roots, names, uh, operations of uh, the drug cartels, and also when in the, the, the war on drugs began in. Uh, 2008, at the beginning of April 2008 in, in, in Juarez, uh, I begin to document and print uh, or expose uh, the uh, human rights abuses by the militaries, particularly. They came to the border to fight against the cartels, but they begin to commit a lot of uh, uh, abuses, uh, assassinations, kidnaps, tortures, everything. So I begin to publish that. and. Uh, at, at some point, uh, I have, as uh, Aaron mentioned, I have good sources of information, and, and the story is very, very interesting and scary at the same time. One day, I was, uh, I took my father to a, with a friend of mine who, uh, he's a herbal medicine expert, and um, he, for many many years, he has a small segment on radio, so he speaks about herbs and things like that. So he knows a lot of people within the media. So that day I came to him and said, oh, this is my father, blah, 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 blah. And at some point he, my father was uh, under, you know, with a specialist and he said, have you heard about the list? What list? Okay. I heard something that there's a list of uh, between eight or 12 journalists who has been targeted by the cartel. And your name is on that list. Okay, and be careful. Okay, <laughs> sure. So I, uh, with that information, I begin to do my own research among my people that I know uh, in, in, in those type of, of environments. And uh, all of them told me, yes, we know there's a list. We know there's a list against journalists, but we don't know exactly who is on that list. Okay, well. 
and then uh, after a series of uh, events that happened uh, that uh, is quite long to explain, but uh, I, I survived basically, uh, and uh, that was one point. The second point was uh, I was working hand to hand with the, with the ombudsman, uh, human rights ombudsman, uh, documenting these. Uh, abuses by the militaries. At some point, I have a good contact within the operational center where the joint forces against the cartels work. So he, one day he came to me, he just passed next to me, he don't even look at me and said, be careful, they know what they're doing, they are looking for you. Okay, perfect, who, the militaries, perfect, okay, thank you. And uh, based on my experience, because they usually, they don't kill you, the militaries don't kill you, but they put guns or drugs or whatever, and they take you to the uh, jail and you are pretty much uh, helpless there. So at some point I have these two threats. Uh, my wife was threatened outside of the house as well, and that was the moment when I decided to, to leave White Canada. Because uh, that's the only place we, we don't need a visa on that time. Uh, I just spent one night uh, browsing the internet, looking for places. Canada, okay, it's not that far. <laughs> <coughs> yeah? So visa, no visa, perfect. Uh, and, and despite that I live right at the border, I, I, the information that I have is these cartels control both sides of the border. So if I move to US, I'll be pretty much the same situation. So I said, well, let's go, let's go. So one night, I just, we just bought the tickets online. Uh, what, which, which place, okay. Oh, the closest flight of Vancouver. Okay, let's go to Vancouver. Where's Vancouver? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Is that cold? Apparently no. Okay, let's go. Yeah. So, and we, we, we just fled. Uh, and the, the point, uh, where, where, as you mentioned, the point where you know what everything has changed is, in my case, it was the morning of uh, the 26th of September of 2008. We have to fly from, from Juarez to Mexico, spend uh, pretty much one day in Mexico, and then fly from Mexico to Vancouver. So when we are leaving the house in Mexico uh, at 4 a.m., because we have to leave really early in order to protect ourselves. Uh, and uh, when I locked my house, when I locked the door, and uh, when I heard the, the click on the, you know, the lock, boom, it's over. And that moment I said, this is over for me. And I realized that behind that door was my photos, my clothes, my life, my my kids toys everything was behind and we have to live and here I am thank you and what you you didn't tell in a story I do know that you have told you you were modest about some of the the th modest is not the right word but you didn't tell all the details about some of the threats that you did face and no. I know um, just briefly talk about the, the driving when somebody oh, rolled down the window. Yeah, just well, to give a sense of this is what, he, this was before he even made the decision to go. Yeah, he was that in happened in, I, I, I clearly remember that day because it's Mother's Day in Mexico, May 10. It's May 10, always is May 10. And uh, 3 a.m., uh, I receive a call and they said, okay, the chief of the police has been murdered. Okay, let's go. So I went there, took pictures and everything. When I was driving back to my house, I was, you know, empty streets, uh, late night, and uh, I just, uh, I was in a traffic light, the red light, and then uh, another vehicle came and parked, like, in this position, and uh, I know a little bit about some pol police techniques, so I know that this is a shooting position. So I, I look at them through the mirror and said, oops, I'm done. So. Green light, nothing happened. I turn left, and they begin to come to me, to me. So they close. And when they put uh, next to me, they rolled down the windows, and I saw two AK-47s out of the window. Since that day, I begin to think and planning my life in death terms, not in life terms. I mean, maybe some of you think about, okay, when I get older, Blah, blah, blah. 
But in my case, since that moment, I begin to think of my life about, okay, who's going to feed my family? Who's going to pay my bills? What am I going to do? Uh, are they going to kill me? Are they going to do that? So, so they just put, show me the, 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 the weapons. Uh, for some miracle, they didn't shoot. Uh, I keep driving. What I was able to do just to turn, you know, the, 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 the interior lights and put my hands over the wheel, the steering wheel, just to show them that I'm not a threat. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have any weapons or anything. And I roll down the window and I look at them and say, okay, maybe you're wrong. But no, they we just keep like this, like maybe, I don't know, I don't know. A long, for me it was like a, a year, so like this. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, next traffic light, I park, I, I, I stop. It was a hotel there, and I was talking to a friend over the, 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 the phone, and he said, go to the hotel, Look, go there, but they, it was closed. Oh. So I said, okay. So I parked, and they, from here, they moved here, and they said, well, okay, m maybe they try to, they're going to try to kidnap me. They didn't shoot, that's good, but they're going to try to kidnap me. Okay, I was waiting, my thoughts were, if, as soon as I see one guy coming, I'll, I'll, I'll I, I mean, I'm going to I mean, use my car and try to escape or something. We stay there for, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes, just like cat and the mouse, just like them, just waiting for them, and I don't know what they're waiting. I see a lot of movement behind the, the, the window, probably. They, I, I think, I assume that they were talking, mm -hmm. someone waiting for something, I don't know. And they left. So, yeah. So I went back home and, and uh, yeah. And they sent their message to you. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that was only and one message. Is, exactly. Um, Aaron, you spoke about obviously the, the incredible toll that this has taken on your, your family and the, the sacrifice made. Um, is there, I also know that the Eritrean community, there's been reports that the Eritrean government has certain spies within Canada have you had any instances here, obviously it doesn't compare to Eritrea, but have you had any instances here where you feel at risk here? Yes. Hang on. Hello? Okay, that's it. <laughs> uh, yes, that is a sad thing that needs to be told, everybody should know. Because any Eritrean who fled from his country or her country. The Eritrean government follows them. So even though I am thousands of miles away from Eritrea, because I never stopped criticizing the government, so, and I never stopped exposing whatever wrong they were doing, not only in Eritrea, even here. So the Eritrean government here uh, they force Eritrean Canadians to pay 2% tax of their income, and which is totally illegal. And since I run a community newspaper here, so we always talk about this. Uh, we try to convince the Canadian government to take action. Uh, I also write in other websites uh, in our language, which is Tigrinya, so whenever I write critical things, uh, there is always uh, a threat, telephone threat, uh, uh, different kinds of threat. Since they don't dare to do the action physically, or so you have to be ready for everything. Uh, what they do is they simply uh, do some vandalist work. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2007, while I was dining in one Eritrean restaurant, they slashed the tire of my car, so both of them. <coughs> then, of course, I reported to the police. Even the telephone threat, you refer to the police, but it's very hard to know who did it exactly. Mm -hmm. But they are agents of the Eritrean government, and they are uh, governed by the Eritrean consulate who live here. In 2008, the same thing. In January, it was, uh, I don't forget that one, I used to work at Sheridan College. Uh, in the morning, I woke up uh, to go to work. I found 
the front and rear windows of my car smashed, mm. both of them. Uh, of course, I reported to the police. Uh, so you know who did it. Uh, I mean, you, you know it is the Eritrean consulate who is sending them to do this uh, stuff. But you don't know exactly who is that person. So I report to the police, but the police, it's very hard for them to know who did it. Uh, so it is, it is not only uh, for me, the, such kind of um, what you call staff. For anyone, if uh, the person doesn't follow their order, they have a way to discipline them. So we always wonder, Eritrean Canadians, who is governing us here? The Canadian government or the Eritrean government? So it is, it is a common story for all Eritreans. But luckily that 2% tax is now stopped because of uh, serious campaigning and lobbying that we have done the last uh, six years. The Canadian government took action. They expelled the Eritrean consul from here. And, but the office is still functioning, so this vandalism is still in action. Thank you. And Mary Mac, ask you the same question. Your, your problems really came more when you came to Canada and the pressure. Tell us a little bit about how you knew it was a problem and that you couldn't go back and, and what you face or continue to face here. Um, everyone knows that Iranian elements or agents of Iranian government are very active within the community. Um, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that they um, do research, they're present, they actively follow the members of Iranian community, either the activists, political activists, or media activists. Um, I have not had um, personal experience in this regard, but I know that there are so many, even my colleagues, fear of um, revealing their identity when they are doing activities helping um, Iranians inside Iran or assisting activists um, getting online access because of the crackdown on media and freedom of press. They are present. Uh, the, the Canadian government has done a lot apparently to somehow limit, uh, you know, we don't have an embassy here. The Islamic Republic does not have an embassy here, there's no relations, so they have limited their activities inside uh, Canadian borders, but I'm sure they are listening online now and they're probably chuckling. <laughs> well, we, I think we helped them out with the live streaming, so, um, you know. <laughs> the, the, level of, the level of infiltration <laughs> among the communities right. all over the world is huge, yeah. And, and feel free on this next question for, for all, all of you to jump in, but in particular, I think Luis and, and, and Maury, with your involvement with CJFE, can, can help with this. You know, as I said, I think Canadians, we do take uh, free press, uh, free freedom of expression for granted. Uh, and also, when journalists come here like yourself, it's difficult at first. I certainly know your story. Still. And, and still. W what can we do as Canadians both to help promote free press, not just abroad, but, but at home, and also to help journalists in exile and perhaps help them report from here. Uh, uh, um, when we, when uh, I came to Canada uh, from Japan, uh, you know, we are in constant uh, uh, under our, not only us, but also our families are under pressure. Uh, and uh, constant eye of the government. In Iran, uh, the house is uh, under control, the phone is under control. And, uh, and also, uh, like in Japan, uh, when I was in Japan, the embassy were sending people, uh, you know, when I, for example, wanted to go home late night uh, after my work and uh, a person was jogging 
um, you know, right beside my house and, uh, you know, uh, ready to uh, uh, use the knife or, you know, you think a lot of things. And so, in, I'm not, I'm going to, be, to uh, go back to your question, but uh, to continue Mariam's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you asked that question, here in Canada, when, uh, uh, when I came, well, Canada is uh, 11,000 or 10,000, I think, miles away from Iran, and, uh, but still the government has its agents through embassy, and, uh, uh, and uh, even in Waterloo, for example, the university has a lot of uh, people who are uh, getting together and uh, pray like a pray uh, group. And uh, they, uh, uh, you know, even Ayatollah Mespa Yazdi was here in Waterloo and uh, visited Mennonite uh, and uh, they have their followers. And when I say Ayatollah Mespa Yazdi is a fundamentalist follower, for, uh, Ahmadinejad follows uh, him. So uh, uh, this exists here, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, they take photos, they, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are aware of our activities. Uh, but when, uh, you know, uh, comes to the freedom of press and uh, uh, freedom of uh, expression in my country, uh, I think uh, uh, media in my country is, there is no, there are no opposition uh, or even uh, you know, independent media in my country, and uh, there is there is no um, um, media that uh, voices the opposition of the regime, and uh, only the reformists. Reformists are religious, and uh, it's like uh, you know, uh, reformists during the Middle Age, uh, you know, and uh, Khatami or Rouhani. Mm -hmm. They are like, uh, uh, like Voltaire, uh, not Voltaire, I'm sorry, uh, like uh, the church at the time in the Middle Age, and they are just uh, bringing reform in the... So the press, they have their own press in Iran, and, uh, um, and that press is, uh, again, it is being uh, watched by the seven member of the uh, media watchdog uh, appointed by the uh, Ministry of Guidance. But do you think Canada or Ottawa gets involved enough, or people get involved enough, pushing to have a greater press, local press? Um, I, think, I think uh, Canada, Canada's role um, as uh, uh, a, I think, uh, United Nations uh, role is declined. I think the uh, United Nations can play a better role in the world, uh, especially in the Middle East. Uh, you see the, what happened to the Arab Spring, um, and uh, the people wanted freedom, and uh, w w the Green Movement, the uprising, it's the same. So uh, the United Nations should really implement uh, more uh, and, uh, you know, uh, role uh, on media, because media is building the nation, and media is um, uh, bringing a kind of culture, and it is the uh, fourth column of the democracy, and uh, so uh, media is the biggest uh, uh, has the biggest role in building a nation, and uh, I, I, I think uh, can Canadian government uh, by uh, uh, like the policy of Canadian government, I don't understand because uh, you know, like uh, it's uh, uh, it it declined uh, its position from United, uh, human rights uh, position to uh, you know uh, a kind of position that uh, it's it's a follower. Uh, I think that's maybe CG's next panel next week on <laughs> the Canadian position in regards to the United Nations, but thank you. Maybe Luis then if you can address the issue of individuals, because I know your story when you were here, it was really, when you first arrived, it was, it was incredibly difficult. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, just before that, I just forgot to mention that uh, in my lifetime as a journalist, uh, seven 
either colleagues, people who work directly with me, or people that I knew uh, are, are dead now. They were assassinated in different times. One of them, a month later after he fled, and his name was included on that list. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and also um, in in my life in, in my life as a journalist, and three times someone, unfortunately, those three times were people. No, two times were people, uh, police. One soldier, one police, and one criminal. They put a rifle on my chest and they told me, "I'm gonna kill you." Uh, well, when I came here, well, I, I, as I told you, we came close eyes. I thought I can speak English when I came here, but then I realized that I didn't. <laughs> I, yeah, I, on that time I spoke Spanglish, which is kind of mixed because we are at the border. Uh, so we have to go to learn English still. Uh, and uh, in, in life, it's, it's really hard when you came as a, as a refugee because you have to face a lot of things. and. Uh, uh, my wife and myself, uh, we worked as janitors for two years. Uh, my wife also, on that time, she worked as uh, housekeeping in the mornings. She came back home. Uh, I was in charge of the kids. Uh, then we just feed the kids, put them in bed, and then we have to work the whole night uh, cleaning three different buildings. And uh, on that time, the, the worst part for me, and I, I think I told to Michelle that story before, the hardest part for me was when, when I have to, we have to, it's a big community center, and uh, I have to vacuum a small library. And uh, the hardest moment of the night for me was when I have to vacuum the newspaper aisle. <laughs> because I was vacuuming there and watching pictures of my city, stories about my in my case, I feel lucky because I, I went to Massey College, then I went to the Monk School of Law Affairs. I have scholarship, this and this and that. But I met people vacuuming there that they are smarter than I am. And I didn't have that opportunity. So that's something that, please do it. Give us a chance. Just, you, don't, you, you can invest five minutes. How are you? Who are you? What are you doing here? How do you come to Canada? Just give us a chance. And uh, I'm sure that you will be pleased to hear that there's really, really smart people like these three uh, sitting next to us. And I think also on that note, media organizations have a role to play too. And I know this is something we talk about at the Star a lot and we don't necessarily do enough, which is partnering with, with journalists in exile and, yeah. and working together on stories. And I hope, I know at CGFE we've really pushed that, so I hope that happens yeah. more. Miriam, did yeah. you want to add to that? Uh, uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just the one, uh, one thing I want to add. I'm sorry, Mariam. Uh, when I came to Canada, uh, we organized a group of uh, journalists, like 32 journalists from different parts of the world. And uh, we gathered in CJFE, and CJFE uh, consists of, uh, you know, the board members are uh, a lot of uh, people from media industry, like uh, CBC, uh, Toronto Star, Global Mail. They helped us uh, to, they gave us location, we, we uh, you know, we get together. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, they support us, uh, not financially, because at the time CJFE didn't have money. Uh, financially it was uh, broke. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, but they gave their place and they supported morally. And uh, um, like Luis uh, and uh, my friend here, I also, when I came to Canada, I started like picking uh, fruit, uh, like peaches in uh, Niagara region. And uh, on the top of the tree, peach uh, tree, I was eating the best peaches, <laughs> <laughs> freshest uh, uh, peaches. And at the same time, I was writing my poetry. And, uh, and, uh, and also, you know, I don't know why, oh, I just want to put this here also. I don't know why the Canadian uh, government policy is to bring journalists or people from different countries to this country uh, uh, during winter time. 
<laughs> and uh, I don't know why anybody should come during winter time, the, frankly. At the time when I came, really it was like I, as if I'm in Siberia and Gulag. <laughs> and uh, it was the worst winter, <laughs> they said. It was the worst winter that I was. Thank you, and, uh, <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> Miriam and then Aaron. Um, I just wanted to shortly uh, address the question that you had regarding the, what Canadians or Canadian media can do regarding freedom of press or freedom of information outside. Around the around the world, um, I, in terms in, in in the case of Iranian journalists and activists, I have noticed how campaigns and outreach and um, other activities, especially online gathering signatures, have been effective, which is very good. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how Canadians can help journalists in exile survive here, despite all the psychological pressures being uprooted and all the challenges that comes with living in a new country, especially when you're a refugee, it's just job. You need a job to survive. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been never offered to any of us. Um, I was lucky, I met an angel in CBC. Um, his name was Jim Williamson. He gave me a chance, he opened the door. But it rarely happens, and especially at that time, at this time, that great journalists like Lyndon McIntyre are stepping aside. It may not be the best time to ask for jobs from Canadian media, but it can be a good start with fellowships, like um, internships, three yeah. months, because all they ask is Canadian experience, and we don't have Canadian experience right. when we come here. No, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. And there's a way to, to, as I said, partner or an internship or a fellowship. And if we, if you put it into a, a system, and it's going to happen every year, it would, it would help a lot. Aaron, you wanted to add to this, and yep. then Luis. I think uh, they said it um, because uh, I was lucky, so I didn't work like. <laughs> uh, I was. Uh, working at George Brown College mm -hmm. so with the help of Pen Canada. So, yeah, something has to be done especially to help the writers in exile. Uh, because writers in exile, they can play a great role uh, in this country because uh, they can connect the two cultures because the challenge is that you live, uh, you experience as a writer is very challenging because you have a kind of two personality, one from your own country and another one here. So to balance those two personality, it is very hard to handle it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, you have to integrate into the Canadian society. And at the same time, you are not fluent with the language of this new country. And you really want to connect that uh, uh, what you call the culture with your home country, of course, you really want to educate your community who live here. Because uh, in Canada, we have more than 300 community newspapers. Right. Uh, my newspaper is one of them. So we have an association. And the people of those communities, they read those newspapers. When there is election, they are the one who educate their own people with the language that they can understand. So if those people are getting that education, if they learn how the political system works, the social system works, the economic system of this country works, then they would feel comfortable to participate in the Canadian society. But if they don't know what is going on, mm -hmm. it is challenging. So uh, yeah, you expect the government to do something to help, because sometimes one channel is not enough. It is good to look in every angle so that you can help. And the Canadian media also, you know, uh, of course it is, uh, there is corporate media and there is also the public media like CBC. Uh, because back home we have only just small newspapers, but we depend on circulation, and people buy those newspapers 
No advertiser can influence us. Mm -hmm. So here, of course, the Canadian media is doing its best to cover the story. But I really want the journalists to go a little deeper in order to put the government on track, uh, not only covering what is going on, but the investigative reporting is dying. The I, Canadian media putting the holding the Eritrean uh, government to, to account, you mean? Or the, the, even the media here. here holding the governments abroad to account? D uh, no, the Canadian media even right. here, you know, you really want this like investigative reporting right. uh, is dying. And you really want that to uh, come to life right. so that they can help the system to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, follow its uh, route, of course. And the influence of the Canadian media is going to be very helpful to convince the international community. For example, every year we remember the journalists who are arrested. Right. You really want to hear a lot of coverage about this stuff. Uh, but uh, I don't hear that uh, things. Of course, the CGFE, uh, Pen Canada, they are doing their best. But it's not but covered. The coverage of the media uh, yeah. is not as I expect. You know, Aaron, I think that's another argument for partnering too with organizations. One of the great secrets of foreign correspondence, the, the type of work I do, is that when you go to a foreign country, you need somebody to help you. We, we call them fixers. And this is somebody that will will hire in a country to work with. And they can do anything from driving, translating, arranging interviews. And I've become really good friends with people that I've worked with, and sometimes they're journalists. And the most important task is explaining the nuances of that country. Sometimes I double byline with them if we work closely. So you could do the same with journalists who are here to really give a richer foreign coverage here. Because let's face it, the, the foreign press knows the issues best or sorry, the local press knows the issues best, but the policy is being driven by the, the mainstream media and the politicians who are reading that. So I think that's a, another, another argument for a partnership that I plan to talk to the star about again. Um, and as Luis answers this question, I'm going to, after, um, after he comments, I'm going to open it up to, to audience questions. So if you want to start making your way down to the two mics, if you have a question, uh, Luis. No, just briefly uh, about this partnership. I mean, we have to be realistic and we know that the newspaper, the media industry is shrinking and it's really bad times. But I think that there's, there's another opportunity that uh, are, are there. Uh, one, of course, the, the most important could be partnership, with uh, partnering with journalists, organizations, or so on. But also, I think that uh, we, we as, as, as journalists, we have a very interesting we have a lot to give to the con to the country. Uh, for instance, uh, we, we we can go to school. For instance, we can we can there's there, you can find there's going to be uh, more opportunities for journalists or for foreign journalists that they can go to school uh, to get a, either a master's, a bachelor, whatever, any capacity. But because that is going to help us to settling the society, but also to show the society the things that we know about, and, and sometimes that the other, I mean, Canadians don't understand at, uh, thing as they should right. understand. For instance, uh, I had a, this experience when I went to university that sometimes I have hard, I mean, very <laughs> interest, intense discussions with professors about the way that they see Latin America. Right. They said, wait, wait, wait. No, ba, ba, ba. Why? Because this, why? And then it's an inter interesting debate that helps to build a better society. So that's another issue that can be uh, partnering with universities or sure. partnering yeah. with newspapers. I mean, just give us a chance. That's, I think that's that the message. Just adding to the public discussion. Exactly. Um, because people are shy going to the mics, I'm also going to, I think... <laughs> my eyes are good enough. I'm going to read questions that are coming in online, so maybe I'll start with one of those. And if you have questions, please come down. I have others, so don't worry if, if there's none out there. Um, this question comes from Jean in Toronto, and Jean asks, what have been your experiences engaging with Canadian diaspora? Were you hesitant or motivated to connect with others from home when you first arrived? And whoever wants to jump in on that, 
I, when, when I arrived in uh, Canada, I uh, was uh, assigned uh, in St. Catherine, uh, where I experienced the worst uh, snow. <laughs> but, uh, but we have a theme going here. But Mark. as soon as I arrived, uh, I knew I have uh, to go out, and uh, at that time it was uh, the war uh, in Middle East with Iraq was started and I went to that gathering and I had the speech there in the gathering and right there I made a lot of connection and uh, uh, and also with the media uh, in like St. Catherine standards and uh, you know we I uh, I think it is all depends to the people that they go to a country and uh, they have to like connect with uh, different uh, like in community if you live in St. Catherine for example you just go make connection with the media with uh, with activists and uh, and so on did you connect with the Iranian diaspora here Iranian diaspora uh, in St. Catherine was very few but at that time <laughs> most of the Iranian they they were in Canada were all uh, uh, I think political uh, groups, sure. uh, because uh, they were driven out of the country and they uh, were brought uh, to different parts of the world. Right. So, but most of the Iranian diaspora lives lived in uh, Toronto, in uh, Montreal, and in Vancouver. We have right now like 200, close to 200,000 people here in uh, Canada, uh, if I'm not mistaken and uh, uh, most of them live in uh, Montreal, Toronto, and uh, Vancouver. But was it hard for, I mean, Aaron and Mary, you must have felt this too, was it, was it hard to reach out to the diaspora when you would be suspicious because you're not sure who's in the diaspora here? And you talked about threats here in Canada. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, when I uh, was granted political asylum by the Canadian government, because from Sudan I went to Kenya. So they asked me, where do I want to go? Because they had no one in Canada, and I don't know about Canada much. So I, asked, I told them, just take me wherever you want. So they brought me to Regina, Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Regina. So, <laughs> Regina, it is a lovely place. <laughs> Fortunately, I arrived in August, so it was not winter, because I have never seen snow in my life. And uh, the people are very friendly. The place is very beautiful, but the weather was not friendly. So I had, and there are not many Eritreans at that place. Since I had a plan to start my newspaper, so I moved to uh, Toronto. So when I came in Toronto, because I was in the blacklist of the government, so I was identified very quickly because uh, so many things was written about me after I fled. Uh, so uh, from the beginning when I started my newspaper, it was very hard to deal with the, the community because they are controlled by this Eritrean government. And every newspaper that I print, when it is distributed, they use it to dump it in the garbage bin in order the people not to read it. So uh, it, was, it was tough uh, to deal with them, uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, so the only way that you can do is just uh, recruit some members of the community and I write just one line, those people who does that, then they are going to be uh, you know, uh, just brought to justice, so you just right. give them a little tip. But it was difficult to deal uh, with the diaspora community. So at the beginning you don't understand why those people get scared. Mm -hmm. So once you know how this government, the Eritrean government, controlling them through the consulate, the agents, then you know exactly uh, where they come from. Mm -hmm. But it was tough, but you have to expect it, so it, is, uh, it was common. 
Sure, it's really scary at first, I imagine. Mary, I saw you nodding your, your head as well. Um, I had a great experience actually with my community, with, with, with the Iranian Canadian community. Um, actually, Mori was the very first person who picked me up from the GO station and took me to Oakville. Like it was, I was a few weeks in, in Toronto and he, I was introduced to him. CJFE was a great help, but in terms of my own community, I had a huge, I was volunteering in different organizations, I was super active. And I wasn't afraid because I had come from a more dangerous country to Canada and I wasn't aware of the surroundings and, and the, 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 the rumors or the realities of being followed or, or being um, under, under the Iranian government's eyes. But I had great experiences because um, the volunteering um, experience was great. I found a huge network, found a lot of friends, and I'm still in touch with them. So it and worked for me. You had Maury to tell you to go to Oakville, not Regina, so you were a little <laughs> bit closer. <laughs> yeah, I could be that was a good trip. If you'll permit me one tangent, uh, one of my favorite stories that I've covered over the years was a, started as a tragedy of a boy I met in Mogadishu at his hand and his foot cut off because he wouldn't join a terrorist group. And we wrote about him and thankfully people got very involved in the story and they rescued him. And he was applying to get refugee status. And I'll never forget, forget the day that called and heard that he was going to Harstad, Norway, 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. <laughs> this poor boy who had never been out outside of Mogadishu. But the point of the story is he is thriving there. And I think no matter the harsh weather, it's all about the community and the support that's there. And I'm happy that finally <laughs> you found that here. And I, although you have moved from Regina, but... <laughs> Luis, did you want to answer that, uh, that one? No, just in my case, I think it's diff a little bit different because I, I've been, pre despite the, I don't know if you know that, at, at least in the GTA, uh, this, the first language, of course, is English. The second language more uh, that is most uh, used at home is uh, Mandarin. Now the third one is Spanish. And people 30 years and uh, younger. So it's a new generation of people coming to the country, but uh, I'm not, and, and I, I'm not really engaged on the community because of my own fears, my own ghost, I, I will say. And uh, actually, I've been, sadly, I've been trying to not engage my family on this, all these things because of some situations that we faced uh, in Vancouver, uh, and. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not that into that uh, engagement with the community, pretty much. And we do have, I think, a question at the microphone. So, if you don't mind, just stating your your name first. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Great question. Who wants to, to start on that? Perhaps, Aaron, you've had the, the really difficult yeah. time. Uh, yes, that was the most challenging part of my life, because um, I came to Canada at the end of 2002. But my wife and my children were not allowed to leave the country. Uh, so the government, the Eritrean government refused to give them exit visa even though they were granted visa by the Canadian government in 2003. So it was very tough for me. Then we have to do everything to smuggle them. But since my wife uh, was scrutinized by the government and she used to be summoned to the police station for interrogation once or twice a month, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, to even to smuggle them, because uh, they always follow her, so you don't know who. But finally, since we didn't have any other option, uh, I smuggled them in 2009. Uh, then they joined me to Canada in 2010. 
So my youngest son that I left him while he was only six months old, I met him when he was eight. Mm -hmm. So all of them are here now. And so I, I was one of the luckiest, but my colleagues, they are still in jail. And still, I, yeah, my brothers, sister, my mom, uh, they are still living in Eritrea. Of course, I call, I chat with them, just only family staff, because you don't want them to, you know, put themselves at risk. And, and for me, it, what helped me is, from the beginning, I acted as if I don't care about them. Because one way the Eritrean government do to discipline Eritreans who live here is by intimidating your family members who lives in Eritrea. So I never fall into their trap. So I use it to write against them, I use it to speak out. So they assume that I don't care about them. Then that helped me at least to smuggle them without any uh, difficulties. Uh, well, just, well, so well, just in my case, I, I fled with my family because my wife was threatened outside of the house. Uh, he was followed and then he was threatened by, by two guys. And, uh, but however, uh, it's, it's tough because uh, three years ago my father-in-law passed away suddenly. Two years ago my mother-in-law had a mastectomy and last, this year, the beginning, no last year, uh, last year my brother-in-law had uh, cancer. Mm. And my wife is the only daughter in the family. So she was, she can go to to the funeral of his father, of her father, to support her mother and to support her, her brother. Uh, and that's, it's really tough. I was telling at, at, at lunch that that's an emotional burden for me because if she and my kids are suffering, uh, what they have to face here, my middle one son, he was bullied at school and a lot of things. Uh, if they have suffered that, is because of the choices that I made when I was there. I decided not to take bribes. I decided to investigate. I decided to publish. I decided to expose. And uh, that's something really hard sometimes when you have to, uh, you, you, you see the suffering in your family. And uh, my, my mom and my dad, I, uh, since I was there, you isolate. Probably you did the same. You, you have to isolate and you have no contact with anybody because you know that they're, they, they may be in danger. Uh, just my parents, uh, maybe you heard about two or three years ago about a big fire in a casino in a big city in Mexico. There's like 67 people died. Well, my parents lived around the block and that day, because of my mom had a delay in 10 minutes, they survived. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they, they say, okay, let's go to the casino to watch a baseball game. And my mom, something happened with my mom, say, okay, we have to wait for 10 minutes. When they, just across the board, the, 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 the corner, they saw the flames and the shoots and people running and dying. So that's, and how, and, and the thing is, when I was here, I was watching Twitter. Okay, there's gunshots, there's grenades. And I know the area, I said, oops, my mom is gonna be, you know, in yeah. panic. I called them, they never replied because they were right. outside. And then the casino is burning, and I knew that they liked to go there. Oh, that was really, really tough. I liked two hours of really... You feel really far away at that Exactly. Point. Yeah. And calling and calling and calling, and finally they pick up the phone and said, okay, no, we are okay, but this happened. So, and you think, okay, yeah. what if has happened with my father-in-law and mother-in-law? Right. That's, that's it's really tough. Yeah. Um. In, in my case, I think it was, um, unlike other colleagues, my psychological torture started when I moved here because my daily life is involved with uh, nostalgia and, and sadness. It's daily and constant sadness. Um, sometimes the Canadian government decides not to issue visas for our relatives. That makes it double difficult um, and we don't know why um, because as, as citizens we have every right to invite our relatives and have a reunion. Uh, that rarely happens. My parents visit but they're old 
So it's very, very difficult for them to sit in the plane for over 20 something hours. We often travel to the Middle East, to Dubai, to have reunion with my brothers. My brother suffered a very chronic disease. I could not be, be, be with him. It's, it's something you, you have a daily life, but you have a constant sadness with you. You feel isolated and your happiness is never complete. I have a beautiful family life here. My husband is stuck with me. He cannot go back. My child does not have an um, Iranian passport, Iranian ID. He cannot see my homeland. It's hard. But we survive. We are lucky we are here safe and sound and happy. So. Thank mm -hmm. you. And we have another question on the mic over here. Hi, my name is Lindsay. Um, my question is for all the panelists regarding uh, our domestic media climate here. So lately in the journalistic community, given the declining media revenues, there's been a lot of debate about advertorial journalism. So people writing articles paid for by outside sources, corporations, whoever. My question is, um, what impact, if any, do you think that this would have on our free and independent media climate here in Canada? That sort of dovetails with, with one of the, if you don't mind me doing a part B to your question, because it was a question I was going to ask, um, you know, what's this, what is the state of media here with declining resources? Um, but also I think, you know, it's, it's, we've pointed tonight is, is looking abroad, but all too often we don't look here, and I think there's never been a time when our own free press has actually been under attack. Um, I know we did an annual report card at CGFE, and looked at the access to information laws. And Canada is 55 out of the 93 countries that we look at. So that's, you know, just a tiny bit behind Angola and Bosnia. Um, I know I get frustrated every time I try and get an answer out of Ottawa on something. You know, what do you think coming, obviously nothing like the repression that you had, but, but you've all been here for some time now. What do you think the current state of media here is? And um, with Lindsay's question in terms of declining resources, this idea of, you know, having ad advertisers a bit too cozy with editorial. Uh, sure, Mari. I think uh, uh, based on uh, the information that the CJFE put forward and uh, uh, every year they have uh, uh, a uh, magazine uh, published uh, about the situation of media here, and I think it is uh, it is being put by uh, very expert journalists and lawyers. And uh, as far as I read, uh, first of all, the media is being controlled by um, you know a conglomerate, uh, uh, um, Easy Asper. That's what I heard, and uh, <laughs> and also. Well, I'll push back uh, on a little Conrad bit of Black, the mainstream. And, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, of course, there are also independent uh, media here. They have thousands and thousands of media in uh, Canada. Um, but uh, uh, the major media is being controlled and uh, also, um, uh, you know, uh, it is also hard. It doesn't have a kind of culture-based, uh, um, what is being said and being done is like, hiring like 32 of us we came from different parts of the world and uh, uh, no place in media but uh, which, which could bring more democracy you know like more uh, message from all communities uh, of uh, our communities uh, so i think uh, i think uh, i'm not saying there is none at all right. there is there are like uh, a spectator, Ham Hamilton a spectator has some people there, but but the media is being uh, um, uh, actually uh, not uh, not you know like bringing the voice of all everybody you know like uh, opposition for example um, uh, like uh, the. Uh, CBC or other media, they, they, there is a very little voice, I think, from uh, opposition uh, Canadian who are really critical to the situation 
and who is grassroots uh, here, they, they have no voice. Media. I mean, I think I think I would defend some of the media that, and some of the there is still some invest, good investigative reporting that's being done in Canada. Um, Maram, you worked on the Fifth Estate. I mean, some of the best uh, exposés have been done there. You know, wh what's it been like when? What do you? What was it like working there? Must have been such a, a change from coming from Iran, but. In your work there, you must have come against some of uh, what we like to call the, the, the no comment that seems to be more pervasive in, in Canada these days. How, how do you compare and how do you find the state? Comparing um, what I did in the fifth estate with Iranian journalism? Just in general, the, the state of where, where Canada is at in terms of what we're Well, doing. at the fifth estate, I was very lucky to work with a, with a large group of journalists who have traveled a lot. Um, the experiences that I had, um, it, I was, I felt that I was a part of team. If you want my experience, I was, I felt that I was a part of team that they knew what I was talking about. They trusted me, and at the same time, they knew that they needed to go deeper. They had no politics in their team. Um, what I have experienced in other parts of the CBC, in the newsroom, or other parts of the uh, other Canadian or American media is there is a sort of po politics going on. And also, they have a limited budget, they have priorities, and they're not always looking for the, the sort of news that is directly related to Canadian communities living here. And I think mostly it goes back to the limited budget and a small industry that we have here. I hope I could answer your question. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure, Aaron. Uh, I think what I would like to add in that is uh, because the, it is really sad to see Canada falls, you know, to 55 because I use it to consider Canada is the most progressive country. Uh, but in this 21st century, we are seeing so many things that we should worry about. Because in Eritrea, for example, you know, if you want to interview the way, the tactics that they use it to, uh, you know, access of information is, if there is some issue well, in one school, if you go to interview to the principal, the principal tells you, oh, okay, I have to ask permission. So he have to ask to the uh, person who governs him in the region. And that one he has to ask to the minister, and the minister has to go to the president. <laughs> so we are simply waiting, so we are not going to say anything about this. So by that time, the news that you would like to write is dead. <laughs> so you don't talk about it. Yeah. So the tactic that we were using it, OK, we know they are not going to give us information. But we present it with a different uh, way. Then they get forced to talk about it. Because this is what we heard. But uh, this principal is not able to confirm what happened in this, or this is what is going on. Uh, so we interview the people. We just try to cover the story on that way. And here, the, the Canadian government is doing almost the same thing. Yeah. They deny access for any kind of information. If you want to interview the scientists, they don't allow you to do that. So it, sometimes I worry. and. For me, it is all the same because people pay his life to get that information out. Because yeah. being a journalist is very responsible work, and you don't do it. You know, you don't do it for uh, money. You know, because if you really want to make money, you shouldn't go to journalism. By the way. <laughs> But you have an obligation to do that. So we have to push the government to give that access. And the only way that we can do is uh, by, you know, challenging the system. Because the Constitution really, really helps us to stand for our right here. But what we lack is 
we don't seem to be really care. We just assume this is the journalist works, let them deal. But everyone, even the people, have a right, you know, to help the journalists, and the journalists, you know, and to have to educate also. Right, uh, and, to, and to push it along, to move the agenda. And, and exactly, them, otherwise yeah. it's going to be very difficult. After a few years, right. it's going to be like Eritrea, so it's good to be careful, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, that's well said. Uh, unfortunately, we have time for just one more question here, and there's a good one on the screen too. I'm not sure if we're gonna get to it, but we have a question at the mic. Okay. Thanks very much, my name is Patricia. Um, in light of the fact that a poem was read at the beginning of the session, I was wondering about your interaction with the resistant artistic, or the artistic communities involved in resistance in your home countries. And I was thinking of, in Iran, there's the director, whose name escapes me now, but one of his films is roughly translated as Children from Heaven, and the graphic novel Persopolis. And then today, um, a member of the Russian art band Pussy Riot um, wrote an article in The Guardian, a scathing article against Vladimir Putin. And so I was wondering if you could comment on your involvement or your opinions on the role of art, whether that be film, literature, or music, uh, in supplementing your own struggles in your own country. Uh, you see, in Iran, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a system that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, really uh, against every happiness of the people. And uh, the movie, for example, industry, the f uh, the uh, uh, the cinema. Uh, uh, is being targeted by the regime, and uh, the, the cinema uh, house uh, is being uh, divided to two. One is, uh, you know, the old system, uh, the directors, artists, and uh, the and also the fundamentalists being supported by the regime, um, uh, the Islamic regime. So, in every aspect, you see, it's uh, being, uh, you know. Uh, the the uh, critical writers, artists uh, are being censored, are being uh, targeted. Uh, the their um, um, cinema house is being closed, shut down, and they have to fight um, uh, to open it. Um, and uh, uh, so the uh, the artists like poet. Po poems uh, ev ev in every field is being censored, and uh, uh, and, uh, and so the, the the regime they say uh, broad charm and uh, this and that you know this reformist uh, regime uh, it is within the system and they are not uh, you know uh, they are not opposing the Ayatollah Khamenei and uh, he and his. Uh, Ruling and uh, he's on top and uh, he's control controlling everything. He has his eyes in every. Uh, he's first of all controlling the uh, government, controlling the parliament, and controlling the uh, uh, the ministry of uh, judiciary. So uh, and all of them, they are there are also red lines and. The criminalization of the uh, you know uh, artwork, and uh, it's something that they they only understand. Based on the constitution, we have the right to uh, you know write everything, but uh, but they uh, put things uh, to criminalize uh, all these activities art and uh, so on. So they, uh, the red line is one, for example, you insult the Ayatollah Khamenei right. or leader and you uh, national security, you violate national security. Right, which and is a blanket for so much, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. And so uh, uh, artists, for example, movie maker, they uh, they, they don't leave. Like, for example, Golshifte Farahani is a very beautiful, young, mm -hmm. talented actor, actress, and uh, she's out of Iran. 
because of repression and she's in Paris now uh, and uh, she plays wonderfully uh, a lot of films she played in Los Angeles in uh, I mean in US Hollywood and uh, some other uh, cinemas and uh, directors like Jafar Panahi was put in jail uh, he m made movies critical to the regime and uh, Kiaro Stami, for example, all these big, beautiful, talented Iranian people, uh, directors, who can build the society, who can build the nation, they are being, uh, you know, pushed aside and being supported. The regime is supporting those fundamentalist movie makers and uh, poets, and uh, they have their own. Uh, you know, so in some ways, it's not. It's similar to what we're talking about in journalism. They're facing the same, the same pressures. Miriam, did you want to add to that? Did it's you, just is, um, everything that Mori says is right. They crack down on every aspect of cultural and social life is possible yeah. um, by the name of religion and by absolute power of the leader the judiciary, the Ministry of Intelligence, and all the shadow organizations, everything is possible. Um, music underground has gone underground. Cinema is up, up on the air. Many of the filmmakers are in exile. Some of them are in jail. It's a very sad situation, and uh, even the new government has not been able to improve things. They opened the what we call House of Cinema, which is the biggest independent um, organization for movie makers and producers. But it's just, they just opened it. The red lines are invisible. You can produce your film, you can produce your CD, release it, you e you're either fine or you end up in jail or they censor your book after you finish writing it. So they don't give you a notebook saying that these are the bad things, don't write about it. Some of the obvious aspects of culture and Islam and the government are obvious. Obviously you cannot write about it. But there are so many red lines, invisible red lines that you cannot imagine, but you cross it and then you'll trouble, you're in trouble. So. Thank you. And yeah, yeah just word, quickly, please. and I think that globally speaking, regardless of the type of regime or government that every country has, I think right now in this digital era where we live now, I think for any government, there's three risks, there's three threats that are emerging for the government. Again, regardless of the type of government is the people's right to know, the people's right to wish, and the people's right to try. That, those are the three threats that every government is facing now with all this explosion in information. And uh, we can go from Iran to Canada, and uh, it's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. The right to know, the right to wish, and the right to try. I think that's a great, a great answer to end it on and it actually coincidentally really touches on the last question that I did want to get to but you, you've answered it in that to some degree and that's what impact this new media this comes from Dave in Waterloo what impact this new media is having on journalists and it really talks to the fact that information is traveling so quickly these days and so much is out there thank you so much I know we have just briefly touched on so many topics and I just want to thank you as well for the work you've done. It's, uh, you've done really important work, and I know how difficult it's been for you here. So thank you for coming, and thank you, thank you for what you do. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you, Skishu. Uh, I want to thank Michelle for her moderation tonight. Very good. To Luis, uh, Aaron, uh, Maury, and Miriam. 
I've known a lot of journalists in my time and uh, an interesting, uh, almost universal quality in journalists uh, that I've noticed is uh, this interesting combination of qualities where they have this tough-minded ability to write about the harsh realities and confront authorities, um, a very realistic view of the world that they expose uh, and it takes courage. But at the same time, inwardly, uh, they hold this idealistic, almost uh, sweet or naive beliefs that uh, writing about the truth can lead to reform. And, uh, and I think that hope keeps them going even when the conditions are very tough. We've heard about some of the harrowing experiences that you've all had. The price that uh, some of you continue to pay uh, for the courage that you've shown. Uh, we're incredibly proud that you all chose Canada and we're pleased to call you Canadian citizens and uh, I'm pleased that you continue your struggle for free expression. Uh, so thank you for your courage. Thank you for coming to Waterloo tonight and sharing your stories. This being the end of our CG Signature Lecture Series for the 2013-14 year, I have a couple of other quick thank yous to issue. I want to thank all of our volunteers, the people in the blue t-shirts that you see all at all of these events. They do it for nothing but love of community, so thank you for your ongoing help with our series. I want to thank the audience for coming to thank you. We have a, a coffee and other refreshments reception just after this, uh, so please do join us in the lobby for a few moments. There's a CGFE table uh, there where you can get information about joining the CGFE. We thank them for their help in tonight's events. I want to thank our technical crew. Uh, they're very good. They sometimes encounter problems with the equipment. We had a switcher that was acting funny tonight. I'm not going to suggest a foreign government was hacking our systems, uh, <laughs> but we're going to get to the bottom of this. And, uh, and although it's the end of our lecture series, we do have one more public event this season, and that is this Saturday. Uh, the City of, uh, of Waterloo, the City of Kitchener have a, a, f a Summer Lights Festival and uh, the events start in the evening and go till two in, th 2 in the morning. So our part of that is that we're sponsoring a lecture by Rick Haldenby, a notable local architect who's going to be talking about uh, the, the amazing architecture we have at this corner of uh, uh, Caroline and Herb here in Waterloo. And then also the Notabene Baroque players will be offering some a free concert in our courtyard or indoors if the weather is a bit rainy. Um, so thank you again to everybody for coming tonight and uh, enjoy us afterwards in the reception and, and then have a safe journey home. We'll see you in September. <laughs>